Hi, welcome back to Cubs and Culture for January 30th, 2018. Um, okay, so when both Ben Hur and Gladiator, it's not just that the central plot is basically the same with one taking up and Christian message of needing to put down the sword and bless it other peacemakers, um, and then Gladiator um, uh, being much more of a militant um, film. And also, both films are sort of interested in um, Rome as sort of the backdrop, of course. Um, and in both cases, Rome is held up as... Um, in Ben-Hur, it's a lot more... It's a starker thing, but Rome as a city or as a system or whatever, it's held up as a great oppressor and symbol of decadence. And the glory of Rome is actually horrible because of how how in Rome's um, desire for gro- glory corrupts um, uh, um, a man and Ben so like in Ben Hur Masala is ultimately sort of not the ultimate antagonist it's act because Masala in the storyline he leaves Judea as a boy and goes to Rome and then comes back corrupted um, Gladiator has a little bit more of a sympathy for Rome, where in any case, it's not Rome. Rome, the Roman Republic, has been has collapsed into and been corrupted, and is this decadent thing of um, um, the Roman Empire, and spe- particularly the Colosseum and the blood sport of the games. And so, this sort of issue of thinking of Rome as sort of this great symbol of decadence and oppression and kind of naturally brings up how we should like why as we what why are these two texts i mean like both of them were about ba- huge box office successes um uh and what uh, <laughs> well, driven largely by american audiences so and one of the best picture and whatever so the question is what is it about rome uh, the Americans are obsessed with, and I don't want to get too far into this because Americans have been obsessed with um, Rome since like day one because like neoclassical architecture, neoclassical paintings. Um, the founding fathers were routinely quoting like Cicero and Seneca. Um, but there's something about Americans that we tend to think of ourselves as sort of um, a uh, uh, Ro- uh, Roman in, in like Roman law, and that we're like the, the republic, the republican values that are um, abetted within our constitution, and everything that traces all the way back to Rome. And so, I so the thing is, it's somewhat interesting to me that these two films, um, forty one years apart, one best picture, despite basically being the same story, and it's so. If we are Rome, or at least if we are the Rome of these movies, um, what should we be thinking about ourselves? And this is one of the things, this is what I've been trying to get at all day, and I just have to set it up. Give me a moment. On Ben's her part of it, um, to conquer Rome, to get out of this sort of decadence, we have to become Christian, because again, the movie is ultimately Christian, but because of sort of the tension of it being directed um, by William Wyler, it's sort of social, like it's sort of an, like it's not a very robust or full-throated um, Christianity. It's just sort of, again, culturally us being a Christian nation that we are by far and large culturally Christian. Um, that at the end of the day, that the public square in the sense of not the state, but the business of every day to day life. The thing that human uh, that we as Americans truly share is uh, uh, Christian um, Christian values. Now, I realize this might feel very weird to um to be <laughs> like like what are Christian values? Well, in popular culture today, it seems to be anti anti um, abortion and anti gay people, and that's pretty much it. And, and so there's this issue of um, whether or not the sort of Christian right rhetoric is disingenuous. And I'm going to get into that in the next section. But I really, again, I think like Ben Hur, given that it is so, 
even though it's universally accessible, it is very much a Christian film. Um, and I think that says something about the 19, in that it came out in 1959. It feels like the last hurrah for this sort of, uh, uh cultural Christian, uh, Christendom. Um, anyway, so let's put, put that to the side. Um, on the other hand, for Gladiator, it's, um, again, basically the same sto- um, story, except it takes up a very unchristian message. At least how what I take to be an unchristian message about, um, you have to fight these battles. And, um, Maxima, Maximus's desire for revenge wasn't wrong. And in fact, it's a, something of a happy ending because he gets his revenge. And, it sort of empties the Roman symbol of Rome as a symbol for America or however you want to think about the um, intertextuality, intertext relationships here. It's just sort of stands in for that what we're getting from Rome, um, at least in the, oh, like, so the restoration of the Roman Republic is through militarism. And it's interesting to me because uh, one of the things that seems to have happened hand in hand with sort of the advances in um, uh, LGBT rights and civil rights and uh, uh, women's rights and also having more pluralistic um, movies. Um, Gladiator didn't dominate the way in which um, Ben-Hur did. That militarism, Vietnam War, not that, look, it's the U.S., Society has always been somewhat militaristic. We have been fighting, <laughs> like in the 1800s, we had the War of 1812, um, the Spanish-American War, we had um, the War of Mexico, we had the various um, uh, war- wars against um, First People, which are just genocide. So it's not like Americans have been peaceful this entire time, but it feels like... Um, to me, that even though we were fighting, uh, even through history, even though we were fighting in um, with Manifest Destiny, all these aggressive imperial wars, it doesn't feel like us as a society had militarism um, every single day. Like it's, it feels like militarism, honoring the military, being a militaristic society in which being a member of that taking up the sword is sort of the ultimate value. Like that seems to me has been increasing over time and probably the sort of the um, best example here um, is the national anthem wasn't played in front of um, uh, uh, baseball games until World War I. Um, and then it kind of went away and then came back in World War II and then it stuck in the, in the 1950s. So it seems to me that we but gun and more militaristic. And so it's interesting to me that I think if, again, if you took um, these two films, Ben-Hur and Gladiator, um, insofar, and then corrected for the technology, so because like the Great Sea Battle is not very good visual effects wise, and Gladiator, you don't have to change anything because you're going back in time. If you took these two films and you flipped them in cultural context, you have Gladiator in 1959 and... Um, uh, Ben Hur in 2000. I don't think either film would be, neither film would have won Best Picture, and neither film would have done all that well in box office. Ben Hur would, and again, 2016, this sort of happened. Um, Ben Hur in 2000 would be probably just, I don't think people would denounce it, but most people would be like, yeah, it's a Christian movie. Okay, uh, the church crowd can go, um, see it, and for Gladiator, back in the 50s, it would have been denounced as this ultra-violent, um, uh, not, uh, morally nihilistic, uh, or morally uh, amorous um, uh, story because of the way in which it is so sort of empty, where it's just violence is the... You'd have to take up the sword because that's what we need to do to survive. And so... There's this notion, and this is the only thing you'll ever hear me praise about on from the Christian right, is they complain about this thing about the public square being empty. Now, what they actually mean is the state isn't forcing non-Christians to be Christians, i.e., they consider it on that that the public square is empty because of 
uh, school sponsored prayer, state sponsored prayer not being allowed in school. Um, okay, I'm obviously against that. Okay, um, but I think there's something to this notion of um, the public square being empty in the sense that we don't have a sort of sheared, not even essentially sheared values, but she- sort of sheared um, narratives or sheared um, stories anymore between different groups of um, ideologies. Because uh, even though we're still about, oh, I don't know, 70% Christian, for the other 30% of this country, uh, the Christ narrative doesn't mean much. Now, that always sort of been the case because obviously if someone's Jewish, Christ has always been a false messiah. Um, and I don't think, and I'm not going to argue like the Christian right, that there isn't, um, you should be forcing people, but the state should be forcing people to have certain religious views. I'm What I'm arguing is issues of pluralism are coming up more in this, like, there's a there's a way in which you can be pluralistic, which is in the public area, is that no religious views are allowed. That the state isn't allowed. Like, just use holiday um, displays for a second. That you could you could not allow a Christmas tree or a, a menorah or a festus pole. You just don't allow displays of any kind, or you allow all displays. And it feels like to me a lot of people on the left, I, again, sort of constitutionally, sort of the way in which I view secularism, all or none is fine. I prefer all. Uh, it feels like the left wants to say none, or Democrats want to say none. And I, so like this thing about the Christian right, about this public square being empty, um, or which don't have common shared, sort of shared narratives about what life is about, I actually think is a huge problem. I especially think it's a problem. Because Democratic and leftist candidates are uncomfortable talking about religious views positively in Democratic primaries. Um, so I'm going to pause there because this is really what I want to talk about today. Um, and I'm running out of time. So see you in a moment. Okay, bye.